Good morning. How's everyone doing this morning? Good. Uh, I will just acknowledge from the beginning, it's a, it's a, a little bit of a, a strange day, right? It's September 11th, and yet we're gathered to celebrate the risen Savior in the midst of that. It's, what's crazy to think is Rose wasn't alive when September 11 happened, right? I mean, it's just, it's such a crazy sort of thing. It feels like it was yesterday. Everyone knows it was. They know where they were in that day. She doesn't remember where she was in that day because she wasn't here yet, right? I mean, that's, it, it, but that's such a bizarre part of kind of how we grieve and how we look back. Uh, it's, and it's this strange thing, even as the body of Christ, we, we go, we celebrate the risen Christ, and yet we hold up a cross to be reminded of that, Right? And so it's that we're kind of in that place of tension, which is, I think, what walking as a believer in Jesus kind of is all about, is that tension. So let me pray for us as we begin our time of tension together, our time of worship together. Lord, thank you uh, for this morning. Thank you that your mercies are new every morning. We thank you that you love us unconditionally, so much that you were willing to go to the cross for us. And so as we worship this morning, may we have that at the center of our attention. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand and sing this first song. Before you're seated, wait, stay standing for a minute. So we're going to do a meet and greet this morning, but we're going to do it a little bit differently. Um, small group different. leaders. How's it going to be different, Sean? Well, for one, you and I are both up here right now. This is so crazy. There's this two is, of us at Yeah, the same and you're time. like going back and forth. Yeah. Uh, some of you have already got your group signs. If you're a small group leader and you haven't got your sign yet, uh, Keenan has a sign for you. Come on up right now, though, if you're a small group leader Kelly, who has an here? open small group. Kelly Gaffrey, are you here? Not here. Hope Esposito. Oh, look at you, Hope. Oh, Hope's already on her way There up. you go. Come on up here. No, no, Hope right here. Come you're gonna stand. stand right you're going to stand right just there. spread across Dennis the front Migliato? of the stage. Dennis Migliazzo? No? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? 
Good. Three of you got that joke. Thank you so much for laughing at that particular moment right. in time. Is one more? Uh, let's or do. No. Uh, who does the men's Bible study on Wednesday mornings? Yeah. Fahrenbacher or Wrestler or Chris Geron? One of you guys can hold that. You look like you look like Dennis Migliazzo. I'm going to just hold that up. You're going to be right there because you meet at Jaro's, right? Awesome. Do we have any more? Um, anybody feel like being Kelly Gaffrey? Yeah, you, come on up. You look like Kelly. Come here. Come on up here. That's going to work. It's great. All right, so here, the people in the front represent small groups that you can be part of. So if you're out there and you're feeling so let out, left out right now, just right. like let down, like, oh, I don't have a small group, this is your chance. Right now, during the meet and greet, you can say hi to somebody, but if you're not in a small group, come forward, talk to one of these fine people, and find out how you can join their small and group. And actually, you can do it this way. You can actually use your phone at this moment. You can't remember things. You're like, well, I don't remember who it was. Come up, take a picture of the person, and then email the church and say, that was the person I wanted to connect with. Can you connect me with that person? And you know what? We're going to connect with that person, because that's how technically sound we are. It's awesome. Good? So come forward, get to know a small group leader, or get to know the people next to you. Is that right? Yeah, you have 30 seconds. Go. No. Kelly Gaffrey. Ladies and oh, gentlemen, Kelly Gaffrey. Kelly, Let's Kelly Gaffrey, Gaffrey everybody. Hey, come on. You are the next contestant on small groups at Moore Park Presbyterian Church. Right there. Look at that. Ladies and gentlemen, Kelly Gaffrey. Kelly Gaffrey. Right there. Okay, meet and greet right now. Go. No one's going to come talk, right? Connections being made left and right. This is great. Wow. You get a these. small group, and you get a small group, and you get a small group. It's great. And if the small group gets too big, chop. Chop. That's chop. That's a good connection yeah. there. It's good. It's good. So, Chris, Maureen, you guys are excused. You're good. Thank you. Well done. Very nice. Well done, everybody. Very nice. So this last week, what we did was we spent some time uh, in focus groups uh, and uh, did some experimentation. We uh, experimented with the idea that the, the, uh, the sock puppets last week went over so well uh, yeah. that we were going to just do sock puppets all the time. Yeah. And then uh, the studies came back and they told us uh, two grown men doing sock puppets is just creepy. Yeah. So, um, so instead, we decided to do aprons. There go my Thursday nights. Thursday like nights. That. There it is. Uh, so... Why are you wearing an apron? I am wearing an apron because they're comfortable and stylish and they have, no, uh, because we have a, a lot going on. Are we starting with this one? Do we want to start with why we're wearing Yeah, I think, I think that's probably okay. the best thing to do. Okay, Sunday supper is happening tonight. There's so much stuff going on today. Yes. I mean, there's the carnival outside right after church. If you guys didn't see what's going on, there is a carnival going on and there's food and there's slushies and hot dogs and games and there's a dunk tank that I'm told you're going to be participating in. I've, I've heard that. All right. So uh, carnival games, great prizes maybe, all kinds of stuff. So good. No tithing for a year, top prize. <laughs> oh. No. Joke never no. gets old. No. Um, it's not true. Uh, yeah, so that's happening. And then tonight's Sunday supper. Sunday uh, supper. Yeah, we're doing this because we're serving 
and uh, it's going to be great. I know there's a lot of people signed up, which is awesome. Great. Thank you for RSVPing. Okay, but so we're doing things a little bit differently this time, yeah. right? So if you've RSVP'd to go to Sunday Supper tonight, go ahead and stand up. Good? Good. If you haven't RSVP'd, oh, go ahead and you can sit down. Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause there. Well done. Coming well done. Good. If you haven't RSVP'd, it's great. We're actually doing RSVPs right this minute. Yeah. And so if you decided, like just in the last, the Lord spoke to you in the last couple of minutes, right? And you thought, I need to go to Sunday supper. And let's be clear, if you don't, I know where you live. Yep. Right? It's in the directory. That's the only reason it's I would say It's not a commandment, that, so. but Jesus is watching. Jesus and it is, is a watching. supper. So literally, if you, if you are wanting to RSVP and you want to come tonight, go ahead and stand up so we know how much more food to get. Good. I got... I got going right, once, on. two, three, four, five, sure. so you're uh -huh. got a picture, good okay, picture, uh -huh. picture, stay uh -huh. standing, you guys are doing great, thank uh -huh. you this so much, just, yep. Rouse, okay, thank you it. so much, okay, thank good. you, got it, oh, Blaine's good, okay, you're, you can come back up, all right, good, Sunday supper, tonight, if you, if at 4.55 p.m. tonight, you think to yourself, I'm supposed to be somewhere, I'm supposed to be somewhere, oh, but I didn't RSVP, we don't care, just come, it's going to be great, just be there, I'm going to be doing teppin. And so I'll be doing some fried rice, some shrimps. No, actually, that's not true. No, it's not in the budget. It's a mystery meal. If somebody wants to give budget towards that, we can talk about that, but that's yeah. actually not maybe, going to maybe later on that way. So what actually happens at Sunday Supper? Why are we doing this? Uh, we're coming together. We're going to sit in tables that, like, we come in and just kind of spread out to different tables. Families kind of take a few different so that you get to know new people. Uh, we're having a selection of pastas and sauces and lasagna, and people are bringing either an appetizer or a dessert to share. And then uh, there's going to be some things that we do around the table, some games and stuff. We're going to be worshiping together tonight. Uh, and then you're going to be sharing a little bit, and yep. we'll be discussing some things in table groups. Yep. It's all about community. It's getting to know people that maybe you don't know, uh, because on Sunday mornings, we're all seated looking forward, and on Sunday nights, we'll be seated facing each other. And some of you said donuts and coffee, it's great, but it happens like, and it's gone. Like five seconds, it's over. This is like an extended donuts and coffee with food and drink and all the rest of it. So... Good. It's gonna be fun. Yeah. Anything else we need to say about Sunday supper? No, it's gonna you be great. You don't have to wear an apron. I just want to make that clear. It's it's not. If you want to wear one, you can, but you don't have to wear one. And this I'll evening. say this. It like it's five to six thirty tonight. If at four thirty you're like, you know what? It's hot in this house. There's nothing to eat. We should go, but we didn't stand up in our. Just come. Just come. Just come. It's gonna We'd be love great. to have you there. Uh, trunk or treat. Trunk or treat is happening. That's coming up on. Right there. There it is. It's on Thank the you screen. so much. It's um, coming up in October. October it's be 29th. It's on a Saturday. This is a test for you guys. We know when it is. Saturday, October 29th, we need trunks. Yep. Not the kind that your grandmother or great-grandmother passed on to you. Not that kind of trunk. The trunk of your car, you're going to decorate it, and you're going to give out kid, uh, candy to yep. kids. If you've got junk in your trunk, take the junk out of your trunk and make it into a candy receptacle. A candy receptacle. We're going to okay. get emails about that one. But that's okay. Um, good. We're moving on. <laughs> um, but golf tournament, uh, there is one foursome remaining. So if you thought to yourself, I want to be a part of the golf tournament and I haven't gotten a chance to sign up, really probably by the end of the day uh, it will be filled because one of you is going to say, I need that last foursome. Uh, but there is one foursome left. We'd love to fill it, have it be done. Now I have to think about that any longer. But men's ministry, that is on Monday, this 26th, 26th. of September. And if you don't want to play golf, if you want to just go and join them for the dinner, Go join them for the dinner. You just need to sign up for that. Let Doug know what's going on. Is there anything else we need to know about in the life of the church? I think that's it. I sure hope so. Okay. All right. We're going to make the transition here. Hold on. i got to find my notes here somewhere. Good. You can sit down with the open. I probably should take this off for the next. There you go. You're fine. You, can... you want me to take yours? Yeah, that'd be great. I'd be happy to take yours. Yeah. Let's see if I can not mess this up too badly. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Okay. So we make this transition. So we're at the beginning of a new series today. Uh, it's called Growing Pains, about the book of Acts. We're going to be looking at the book of Acts. And, um, but it's also kind of an interesting day to sort of be kicking something new off and still have it be September 11th. I've kind of talked about this at the beginning of the service. Um, on Labor Day, 21 years ago today, we found out we were pregnant with um, little Hadley, who's now in college and everything else, right? And um, it was just a few days later that September 11th happened, and we thought to ourselves, what in the world are we doing? How can we bring new life into the world in the way it is? And uh, we struggled. It was just, it was, a, it was a depressing and yet joyful kind of time, kind of all at the same time. And 
we, there, those were questions we weren't really equipped to answer. We weren't ready to answer those kinds of questions. And, and yet, within the context of that uncertainty, we were kind of forced to move forward, forced to kind of figure out what was going to be next, how this was all going to sort of play out. And so, really, out of the ashes come possibilities. Out of the ashes come possibilities. Many people observe that the people of New York have a, a more sort of a sense of being more resilient and more resolved as New Yorkers based on the adversity of that particular day, right? It took that community and brought them closer together. It drew them towards this, this kind of common tragedy. So in the midst of the pain and distress of life, we're also called to move forward. To move forward as people of the church, we move forward with hope because Jesus is our hope. I'm going to just um, allow there to be, uh, it's 21 years ago. I'm going to give you about 21 seconds of just silence, quiet. And then I've invited uh, Bonnie to pray for us this morning. So just take a few moments of just silence to reflect on this day. Let's pray. Lord, hear our prayers this morning as we come together, one and all as your beloved children. You are the God of our best day, the God of our worst days, and the God of every day in between. Like moths to a light, we are drawn into this moment where hearts may be heavy with memories of tragedies past and sorrows current. Yet your light offers us peace and comfort as so we come with a great desire to feel close to you and we're desperate to rest our weary souls in your presence. God, today we ask that you draw near to us as we remember the events of 9-11 that affected so many lives and changed so many things in our world on that sad and mournful day. Be with those whose hearts are still burdened with sorrow and grief over the losses experienced that day. And may we all be bearers of forgiveness and implementers of peace to which we have been called by you. God, we also thank, ask you to be with the people of England today as they mourn the loss of their queen, whose 70-year reign reflected so openly her belief in you and her faithfulness to your kingdom. Lord, be with her family as they celebrate her life and legacy and be with all the people of the United Kingdom as they experience this historic transfer of monarchy and all that that entails. And God, help us to trust that the, the invitation of life with you that you so faithfully extend to each of us exists not only for us, but for our neighbors and all those we encounter on a daily basis. On a day of remembrance like today, remind us that humility does not mean thinking less of ourselves, but thinking of others more often. Remind us that you have saved a seat for each and every one of us. Remind us that all places in your house are a place of joy. And remind us that no matter what the circumstances of our lives, we are all welcome there. God, fill our eyes with compassion and our hearts with songs of grace and mercy for all mankind. Help us to come each day ready to write a new narrative that tells others of your deep, deep love for us and for those around us. And now, Lord, we come together, together as the family of God to pray the prayer that your son Jesus taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand now if you're able as we continue in worship. so much. You can be seated. So there's a time in our service where we come together to um, present our offerings, our tithes to the Lord. It's a time for us to give joyfully from our hearts. 
because God calls for us to be joyful and cheerful givers, to give back just a small percentage of that which he gives to us, but not begrudgingly, not as a chore, not as a rote thing, but something that we do to help to build the kingdom. We are all, each and every one of us, individual missionaries as we leave these doors, and that our tithes and our offerings help our church to do this and to be part of the community and the world at large. So there are offering plates in the back. As you know, we can't pass anymore since COVID. Um, on your way out, if you'd like to drop something in there, there will be a slide that will come up that will tell you how to give to the church um, other than that. And I'm going to ask you now just to close your eyes. I'm going to take a couple of moments to reflect on all that God has done in our lives. Please stand for the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Time to dismiss the kids for Children's Church. Miss Cam is in the back there.
So I run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh, oh, again and again and again and again. has been in your sights long before my first breath running into your arms is running to life from death and I feel this rush deep in my chest your mercy is coming Done with the hiding, the reason to wait. My heart found a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I'll run to the Father again and again. I run to the Father, I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, the reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon. My soul needs a friend So I run to the Father again and again and again and again Queen Elizabeth reigned for 70 years. That's a long time. 70 years, she uh, went through a lot in 70 years. She uh, took over the throne after the death of her father when her uncle, King Edward VIII, abdicated the throne because he wanted to go in a different direction and suddenly at the age of 25, she is queen. And 1966, in uh, Wales, there's a mining disaster that took place. I don't know if you've ever sort of read the stories or, or seen any of it. Um, and 116 children and 28 adults were killed. And she made a choice to not go there for quite a while because she did not want to get in the way of the workers that were there. And yet she was heavily, heavily criticized for that decision and she would say, actually, to some of her aides years later that it might have been her greatest mistake or her greatest regret was that she didn't immediately go and be with the community that was mourning there. 1992, her son and Lady Diana and getting a divorce, and that's kind of a whole sort of, you know, deal, right? And then five years later, Diana uh, dies in a tragic car accident, and her response to that was a little bit slow because she wasn't sure exactly how to do that, and she got some good counsel and I think was able to step in and hopefully help people grieve and mourn in the midst of that sort of tragedy. And can you imagine that kind of, uh, as best as I can tell, uh, there were lots of things happening politically, and she really tried to do her best to sort of stay above the fray. 
just that in and of itself in today's particular climate is pretty rough going, I would imagine. People want you to take opinions or stands or stand with somebody or whatever else, and she just kind of didn't do that. And then a year ago or so, her husband died at the age of 99. And if you've seen the photo of her wearing all black with a mask on, and it was a COVID ceremony where there were only 30 people allowed to be there and watch her sort of mourn on her own. So whether we're talking about a woman who reigned over a nation for 70 years, whether we're talking about the, the horrific experience of 9-11 from 21 years ago, dare I say, if you are human, then you understand what growing pains are. The same can be said for the Christian church. Same can be said for the Christian church. We find its form and shape as Jesus dies and is resurrected from the grave. And then the story continues in the book of Acts. And so as we're going to be looking at the book of Acts over the next few weeks, there's this sense that the church is growing and in its growing has growing pains. So we're going to start with... Uh, you know, it makes sense if you're going to study the book of Acts to probably start in chapter 1, which is what we're going to do. We're going to read those first few verses together here today. So I'm going to ask you to stand and we read together as a sign that we're unified under the Word of God, but it's also a place where we read it over ourselves in a different way than we read other things. So let's read this together. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Let me pray. Uh, Lord, um, <clears throat> We want to come to the scriptures differently. We want to not just uh, try to mine them for some bit of wisdom, but we want to have them pour over us, to wash us clean, to change and transform us from the inside out. And so, God, as we talk about this particular passage of scripture, let nothing I might say get in the way of what you would want your people to hear today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So it starts here by saying, in my former book. So the book of Acts is a great read on its own, no question, right? There is drama and great character transformations, huge swings in the narrative, but the author wants to make it clear that, that there's more to the story. <clears throat> and what is more to the story? The, see, the, the book of Acts was written by a guy named Luke. He was a Gentile, meaning he was not a Jew. He was a physician, and he was in the city of Troas, just as the Apostle Paul was about to make the jump from the continent to Asia to the continent of Europe. And this was a strategic move in sort of the expansion of the kingdom. And this is the Luke, then, who writes the Gospel of Luke, and then, as a follow-up to that Gospel, then, writes the book of Acts. And so Luke, Luke writes this gospel sort of in a, as an expansion of his gospel, as a way of chronicle the beginnings of the Christian church. He has now written this particular book, the book of Acts, or as it's many times referred to as the Acts of the Apostles, right? It's the way that sort of falls together. So uh, it, it goes on to say, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. 
you want a summary of the book of Luke, really you just have to kind of look at this one sentence, right? In the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke, the good news that is proclaimed there really kind of is summed up is what did Jesus begin to do and what did he begin to teach, right? And so that's kind of what, uh, this is the transition sort of the book of Acts here that happens. And then it says, until the day he was taken up to heaven. Luke wants to make sure that there's an understanding when exactly this, is, this writing is actually taking place, right? He wants to sort of understand that he's writing the gospel, the story, in a way to point to Jesus. Um, it's at kind of the point at which Jesus is taken up to heaven, and then this is what happens sort of after that, right? He wants to place it in a particular time and place. He wants to build up after the good news of the gospel is sort of taking place. This is everything that sort of happens after that. So that's what this particular moment in the scripture is kind of indicating to us. And then it says, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. So how is this story going to continue? Jesus has given instructions to his disciples. He has given those instructions by way of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus has chosen these particular people at this particular time and imparted this kind of wisdom on them and so that they can go and proclaim the good news to the world. This is the vehicle that he has chosen. This is his Twitter, right? This is Twitter. That was a joke for me. Like, I don't understand Twitter. It's, the, people say something. This was his, the machinery that he's going to use to proclaim the gospel to the world. So, uh, and then the, 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 uh, the scripture continues. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. See, the historicity of Christ's existence, the, the idea that Jesus actually lived on the earth, that Jesus actually died, that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Luke wants to make sure that it's crystal clear that Christ's resurrection from the dead's dead means that he actually first lived. So we need to sort of make sure that, that that's clear. Luke wants to make that very clear. And don't take it from his word. He also actually appeared to a whole bunch of other people. So it's not just my word. It's not just my observation. It's the observation of lots of different people that have seen this and that he was talking about the kingdom of God during those 40 days. Now, 40 days is significant, right? Why is 40 days significant? 40 days, it was 40 years in the desert. It was 40 days that he, sorry, 40 years that the Israelites spent in the desert. It's 40 days that he spends in the desert before he's baptized, and now 40. It's a significant amount of time. It's not just kind of a throwaway line. It's like, I've seen like 40 days. This was the amount of time that he spent. It's important to sort of understand that there was a particular time, and then he goes up into heaven after that. And the scripture continues like this. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Not a request. Not a sort of a kind of a half-hearted kind of a... It's a command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my Father as promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a very few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. See, as Jesus spends time with his disciples, he realizes that they're not sure exactly sort of what's going to take place next. What? I'm, maybe they're scared. Maybe they quietly kind of want to leave town and kind of just sort of disappear because they don't know what's going to happen next, right? But as Luke records here, Christ commands them to not leave Jerusalem yet. Wait. And then there's a bit of a teaser about baptism and what John had done with Jesus and other in the process of baptizing him. But there's going to be a new experience of baptism that comes by way of the Holy Spirit, but not quite yet. And so they wait. You ever been in that experience before where like something extraordinary has kind of happened and you're ready kind of for the next thing to go and you're just like, let's, let's go. Like, this has happened. I'm ready to go, right? I, I've, I've taken my classes. I've, I've finished the degree. I've done these things. I'm ready to go on to the next thing, right? Or I'm kind of done with this job. I want to be done with it. I want to move on. I want to do these things. We are not very good at waiting. We're not very good. At, we've actually gotten worse at it, right? We, we don't see it as a gift of waiting. We see it as the curse of waiting. We see it as standing in the line at bonds, and the person takes out a check. They're going to write a check for a $2.19 package of like just a half gallon of milk. Who does the check get made out to? 
It gets made out to the woman behind the counter. No, it gets made out. Just make the, you know, come on. I don't have time for this, right? You don't have the ability to wait for anything. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for patiently? What are you waiting for impatiently? Verse 6 goes on to say this, Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at the time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. And again, sort of here's this passage, right? And it says, and again, in a sign of being overly eager to figure out what's next, right? The question comes, are you going to bring back Israel back to a place of power? And significance? Well, what's going to happen next? Well, how, how, are you, how is this all going to work? It, it looks like that you have kind of this plan. It has this plan. It's going to go on this way. Jesus, you got this. I want to play the part of this. Can you do this? Can we do this? How, many, how much is it going to cost? Where are we going to speak next? Where are we going to go? How's this going to work, right? And for us, we want to speak into existence that which is going to come next. And that's what they're hoping to sort of do, right? This is the place where we get all the power back, right? This is what happens next, right, Jesus? We want to move to the next thing as quickly as possible. And for some of you, the most prolific words you're going to hear today will be the words that Jesus speaks to the disciples at this time and says, it's not for you to know the times and dates the Father has set by his authority. Is that hard to hear? Yeah. Ask somebody who's sitting next to a bed waiting for someone who is slowly dying. Or maybe they're not. Maybe they're going to come back, and you don't know that. It's not for you to know. And sometimes if we know, we probably wouldn't want to know, frankly. We tend to think the growth of growth is happening in specific activities that we do. God thinks differently. Sometimes the engines of growth are those times of in activity, the times when we are waiting. Those times we are looking for his kingdom of truth and justice and righteousness, and he says, don't worry about that. Just follow me in the uncertainty of the times. Those times when we want to act, and he says, sure, sure, but, but not right now. Those times when we want to move out, and he says, just sit here and wait those times we say, how long, Lord? How long? And he responds by simply saying, trust me, you'll know. It's in the waiting that we have to trust Jesus. It's in the not knowing that we work out our faith muscles in such a way that we grow bigger and stronger and become more faithful. And how do we do that? Probably the same way in which Jesus is telling him that they, the kind of power that they need, it's not the kind of power they think that's going to happen. It's a different type of power. The power is going to come when the Holy Spirit comes on you, when the Holy Spirit fills your life, when the Holy Spirit is the guiding force in whatever steps you take in your life. And when that time is right, when God has everything in the right place at the right time, he'll prepare you for what is next. Just as the disciples didn't know what to do next, what the road ahead looked like, how it was all going to come to pass. Many times we have no idea what's going to happen in our walk with Jesus. Why do I have to go through this in order to get there? Maybe Soren Kierkegaard said it best when he said, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. So I'm going to take a, a little bit um, to talk a little bit about sort of my story and let's be clear, the story is not having me at center stage. Really, it's the opportunity to kind of showcase who God is in some ways, right? So I had been working at uh, Bel Air Presbyterian Church for the better part of nine years. Young adult ministry, and then kind of moved into a number of different roles. I was overseeing children's ministry and youth ministry and kind of had my fingers in lots of different things. Because I was doing young adult ministry, I did lots of weddings um, I did a lot of weddings. Gosh, I did a, we, did a, we went to a lot of great receptions, actually, um, where nobody knew us. So we could just kind of eat and drink and, you know, dance and then go home and not have to think of anything. It was great. Um, 
better part of sort of nine years, right? And I, I kept... I kept thinking to myself towards, you know, the latter part of that career, like, what's, what's next? What do I need to be looking for next? I kept looking for sort of signs of like, this was the time I was supposed to leave, or, you know, this was the sign that maybe my time here was supposed to be done, and I never saw them. So I kind of walked in a place of faith to sort of say, I think I probably should start looking for maybe a pastoral position, a senior pastor position. So in late 2013, I applied to be the senior pastor of Moore Park Presbyterian Church, Right. And uh, Mr. Dave uh, Wilkinson, uh, Reverend Dave Wilkins, the Reverend Dr. Dave Wilkins, I don't know if you're a doctor, but you sure seem like it sometimes. So, um, you know, he uh, had great words for me. I, I spent a little time in his office. He gave me a book and said, read this. It's going to, you know, change your life. It wasn't the Bible. It was some other sort of book. And I, I loved it. I was ready. And um, Monday, I actually looked through my, my, um, my notes, uh, my old emails. Debbie Lee, you'll love this. I received an email from Debbie Lee, from Debbie Lee on Monday, January 20th, 2014. And it said, would you mind responding to these essay questions? Um, I don't know why I gave you an English accent all of a sudden, but it was, it was quite nice. Um, and, and I sent those off to the committee, and I, and I waited to hear, and they chose Mark McElreath. And so I was no longer in the running for that job because they figured out somebody else. And so uh, then, uh, a little bit later that summer, uh, Emmanuel Presbyterian Church in Thousand Oaks. And now, you have to kind of know a little bit of ba background about me, that, it, that this is like 2014, 2015. Well, 2005, I had been an intern at Emmanuel Presbyterian Church. Oh my gosh, what an incredible story. I'm going to tell my children I was an intern in the place, and I, and I knew it well. And, and then I applied for the job, and, and suddenly I was there, and I could talk about, you know, oh, look at what God did. Look at this incredible story that God had. He was the intern, and now he's the senior pastor, and it's just a wonderful kind of story, right? And I went through all the processes and procedures, and I got up to the very last thing, and they gave the job to somebody else, right? It was great. It was great. Where am I in these notes? Oh, sorry, being angry about something. Okay, so. so, and then uh, there was an associate pastor position at a little church here in Moore Park Presbyterian, at Moore Park Presbyterian Church, and so I applied to be the associate pastor. If I can't be the senior pastor, maybe I can be the associate pastor. And I applied, and Bill Gratke got a hold of me, and we went through the whole process. It was fantastic. We got to the very end. I was the last of two candidates. And he called, and he says, the interview was the next day, and I'm assuming he's going to tell me, like, here's how the interview's going to work. You're going to call here. You're going to call there. And he called, and he said, our senior pastor's leaving, so we can't hire an associate pastor. Sorry. So again, uh, not really, didn't go very well there, Right? And then all the while, uh, Bel Air was doing some of their own soul searching, and they made some different kind of budgetary decisions, and I was going to go on a sabbatical. And as I went on the sabbatical, they said, hey, it's great that you're going on this sabbatical, and when you come back from your sabbatical, you don't have a job. And I said, huh? <laughs> what? Baking powder? Right? Like, I don't understand. Uh, and it was pretty shocking. The uh, world got turned upside down. I spent more than a year trying to discern what God was doing in my life. I applied for all kinds of jobs because I knew that getting a Presbyterian job was typically between 18 and 36 months. You Presbyterians, us Presbyterians, take a little while to make our decisions, do we not? Well, mm, I don't know if we should take that candidate or not, right? It's kind of <laughs> the Presbyterian way. Discernment. Discernment. Yeah. So I applied for some other jobs, right? I, I, I applied for, to be a mission director at a school. I applied to be in a sales position at a lighting company. I drove Uber for a short period of time. When I say short period of time, probably less than six days. <clears throat> Great stories, just those six drives that I did or whatever it was. It was not as sexy as I thought it was going to be, right? And then the ultimate position to open. I lived in Westlake Village and Westminster Presbyterian Church was hiring a pastor. My gosh, how can it not be more obvious? I live 1.2 miles away from the church. The Lord has made it so, right? I did an online interview this, through this weird thing called Zoom, right? Nobody had heard of it at that point, right? I did the interview. I did everything else. And I wrote essay questions. And I never heard anything from them ever again. Nothing. Not a sorry, 
Nada, it was great having you. So much, you know, blessings in your life in the future. Zero, nada, bagel, niente, right? Not that I'm holding a grudge or anything else against West Presbyterian Church in Westlake Village, California that is run by a good friend of mine now, right? Come to find out later, they didn't look at any candidates who didn't have former senior pastor experience. They just took half the resumes and they said, well, obviously if you haven't been a senior pastor here, you couldn't be a senior pastor at our church. And so I was left again in a place of not really knowing what was going to happen next. And a friend of mine at Beverly Hills Presbyterian Church called and said, hey, we've got some transition stuff happening. Uh, come here. I was like, I, I would love to do that 77-mile drive to Beverly Hills. <laughs> First day on the job took me two hours and 45 minutes to get there. First day on the job. Because they shut down the 101 freeway, and then I didn't understand other traffic patterns, and I was just like, if this is what the Lord is calling me to, I don't know how this is going to go. Like, <laughs> that was the longest drive it took me the entire time I was there, right? And what did God do at Beverly Hills Presbyterian Church? Uh, he did a couple things. He, um, it was kind of a small job, um, and it was far away, and... But as I reflect on it now, it was the best place for me. I spent two years there, and God healed me. I was broken from being a part of a big church. I'd been through a lot of different things. I'd been up and been down every place else. And it was a place where it was a smaller church where people just loved on me. They told me I was kind of cool because Andrew wasn't. So I was the cool one, right? <laughs> And my friend Andrew uh, was just a place of healing presence in just who he was, and he walked with me. And I did some training as an interim pastor, and I applied to be the interim pastor at where? Everybody say it, Moore Park Presbyterian Church. Yes, for those of you keeping track at home, this is the third job at MPC that I applied for. I was down at It's a Grind with Michael Hughes, and we had a nice conversation I thought was going to go swimmingly well. And they decided to hire a guy that I actually met at the interim training that was with me doing the interim training. Actually, the two of us actually took a hike together while we were at the interim training. And I was like, you picked that guy? And they did. And he was perfect for what Moore Park Presbyterian Church needed in that time of healing. Mike Harbert, great man, right? And there I was, Beverly Hills, trying to figure out what was next. And I applied to be the senior pastor at Moore Park Presbyterian Church. Again. <laughs> and the timing was right. And I started the journey in March 2020, five weeks after I started. Thank you, COVID. <laughs> like the journey to get here wasn't hard enough. As I've told many people, I became a televangelist overnight. <laughs> right? It was uh, somebody after the service, one of the Sundays when we were here, there's nobody in here. And they said, it's so great that you're pretending to talk to the congregation, but there's nobody here. They're all at home, so look at the camera. I said, that's very vain. And they're like... That's where everybody is. They're at home. Talk to them like you're talking to them. So I did that, and then y'all came back, and I was still staring at the camera, and they said, you can't do that. you got to look at people in the room. Which do I look at, the camera or the person in the room? I don't know what to do anymore, right? <clears throat> some of you thought my job was hard. It was a lot harder. There's some things internally going on, and I'm seeing a therapist about it. It's fine. It's going to be fine, right? <laughs> Why do I tell you all this? Because getting to the place of being the senior pastor of this church was not an easy journey by any stretch of the imagination. I went through some really significant growing pains on the way to being the position here. And at the same time, the church went through a whole period of their own growing pains, right? Which then brought the growing pains here and the growing pains here, and it all aligned to a place where it finally kind of was the right fit. And let's be clear, on the way, I was like, I'm out. I really just want to work at the lighting company. It's going to be easier, right? I, I, I want to work at the school. Kids are nice, right? Whatever. I wanted to do something else. But I ended up being here. And it's a great gift to be here. It, God brought me through with all the God switches and everything else, and I wouldn't have it any other way. And if it haven't my way, I'll retire here. Because I love it here. 
But I wouldn't be here like I am today if I hadn't gone through all the really rough stuff I went through before. As we begin the great study of the book of Acts, I want to leave you just with a couple final thoughts about that study. Three thoughts. One, growth comes out of pain, out of the waiting out of the uncertainty. That's where growth happens. Don't resent the challenges of life. They are God's growth engine. Second, life is a journey, not a destination. Everybody seems to be in such a hurry to get to the end of life. But it's really not about the end of life. It's about the journey that we go on as we go. And third, whether life's journeys lead us to growth or ruin, it's really whether or not you have Jesus at the center of your life. You need to spend every effort you have to put Jesus as the centerpiece of your life because it's only when he is the centerpiece of our life that all the craziness and the chaos make any sense at all. Without that peace, I think it just looks like a big, long, painful journey where there's a big God in heaven who's kind of looking down going like, watch me with my magnifying glass mess with these people. Christ at the center. You're like, how is it that we can base our whole lives on the resurrection of a guy? And the hope that comes through that resurrection, how is it possible that out of death came life because of Jesus? You put Jesus at the center, and maybe not in this very moment does everything make sense. But we trust and hope that eventually God puts the pieces to us together and we kind of understand it. If we're lucky, we get to see some of that on this side. Some of it we're not going to be able to see maybe till the other side. And so we dig into this great book of Acts. But it may it always be a way of coming back to talking about Jesus. If we're not talking about Jesus, then we're not talking about anything. Let's pray. God, there's uh, people in this room who have been trying to figure out the, the time that something's going to take place. They've tried to figure out exactly why it is that you have sort of moved them or done this or done that or this part. And for those folks, I pray that they would find you in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the confusion, in the midst of not knowing that they would hold on to you. And as they hold on to you, that you would maybe not give them all the answers they would want, but you would give them a sense of your peace that you'd give them a sense um, that you are actually in charge, that you actually know what you're doing, that you can take even the worst of situations and use them for your good. We trust you. We love you. Help us to put you at the center more. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. the world but it couldn't fill me a man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough then you came along and put me back together And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing. I'm not afraid.
Get dunked, I guess. Yes. Oh my gosh. I don't know what you people are thinking. Um, there was this sense of like, oh, he looks a little unclean to us. He probably needs to get baptized 50 or 60 times or something. So yeah, I'm going to be in the dunk tank in a little bit unless my chiropractor comes along and says, this is not such a good idea anymore. I don't think I can do this. At which point, um, I think uh, Steve Todd, you volunteer to get in there. Is that right? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Todd. Steve Todd. There we go. Uh, so if you haven't figured out, big kickoff after church today, right? Stick around. You're like, um, I'm like um, 11 years old and like I don't do bounce houses. That's fine. Um, watching kids go through bounce houses and get completely like watch them get like rug burns on their face and stuff. It's so fun. It's so fun. So, And there's donuts for crying out loud. And men's ministry has made some lunch. And it's a chance for us as a church to get to know each other better, right? So that's number one. Number two, you're going to come back at five o'clock tonight for Sunday supper, pasta and everything else. You didn't want to make any food today. You're going to get food twice. It's going to be fantastic. We're going to feed you. It's going to be great. Um, you got both of those. But receive this blessing. Is that all we need to do? Do you want to say anything? She's like, no, can we just, I want to, she's like, I'm ready to dunk you. I'm ready to dunk you. That's really what, what's going on there. Receive this blessing. Go, people of God, knowing that in the chaos, in the worry, in the most disastrous of situations, Jesus is there. Jesus has always been there. He's there now, and he will always be there in the future. Amen? Amen. Have a great Sunday. Thank you.